Welcome to worship. I'm Gregory Schultz, professor of philosophy here at Concordia. We are about to join in the invocation and to hear the word of the Lord, so let's stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today's reading is this week's gospel. It's Matthew chapter 20, we're beginning at verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed Jesus. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. You've already heard in today's text that there's a particular prayer that's spoken out by these two blind men whom Jesus gave the sight back to. So in order to be tutored a bit by those blind men and our text, I'm going to invite you during the sermon today um, to respond. Every time I read or recite their prayer, Lord have mercy on us, son of David, consider it an invitation for all of you to respond with, Lord have mercy on us, son of David. Two recommendations, I suggest that you echo that in the same voice the tone that I'm using as much as possible. And you may also want to pause for just a second and close your eyes during or after that prayer um, as you think about the text. So let's try that once, shall we? Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Our sermon springs from the story of Jesus healing two blind men. And so we should think deeply about being blind and about who Jesus is that these blind men addressed him as, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And so rightly counted on his pity. My dear wife and I have four children, two boys and two girls, and four grandchildren three handsome boys and one cutest-can-be granddaughter. I have lots of pictures. As the Lord would have it, this week we celebrated our granddaughter's third birthday on Tuesday, and today we are celebrating our daughter's 30-something birthday. Today is also the anniversary of the death of our older son, Stefan, and our lovely little three-year-old granddaughter whom I mentioned has the same middle name as our younger daughter, Kylie, who died several years ago. As I said, we have four children. Two are with us. Two of them have been with the Lord, the Lord Jesus of our Bible story for several years. Our younger daughter went blind several months before her death which was a few days before her first birthday. Now, I have it on good authority that Kylie has recovered her sight and is seeing Jesus face to face this very minute while we're worshiping here in our Concordia Chapel. So I should mention that I have experienced some trouble with the historical reality of what St. Matthew, an eyewitness of this particular miracle in our text, reports. The problem, I think, is that I need to operate by faith and not by sight myself. My trouble has to do with the fact that on the same day that these blind men called on Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David, and asked him, to open their eyes, he restored their sight immediately. He did not do this for our daughter when we asked and asked and asked. But I am certainly a little slow in these matters. 
you too? Working with these words, or rather, with these words working on me, I've discovered that I once was blind, and now I see, as we sing in the hymn, but that sometimes I go blind again. So I cannot do without Jesus' word and his very real mercy day in and day out. Knowing how we in the Concordia family suffer, just think of the prayers we have been praying for so many these weeks after All Saints Day. And knowing as well our day-to-day -day need for Jesus and his enlightening word, how would it be if we would just sit on the ground for a few minutes right now, like the beggars we are, and call out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us, Son of David. So here again is our text. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed Jesus. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Selah. That's the regular term in the Psalms for telling us to pause a couple of minutes in order to take God's word to heart. Jesus is walking west and south from the Transjordan to Jerusalem in order to be crucified when he and his disciples and followers go through Jericho and then back into Jericho. So this is after nearly three years of Jesus' public ministry. This means that these two blind men know three things. One, they know what Jesus of Nazareth has been saying and doing. They've been hearing all about it. Two, they know that Jesus is a descendant of King David. They've been hearing the buzz on that for some years. Three, they know that everything Jesus has been saying and doing has matched the Messiah stuff that Moses, the writers such as King David, and the prophets had preached and written down in the scriptures. Here's a question. How did they know this? Why had they paid such close attention to it that they knew to call on Jesus as Lord, as Son of David, and as the one who would have to show mercy and heal their blindness? Well, they knew this because they were blind. They used their ears. They really used their ears in a way that we normally don't. As Moses had instructed them, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and so on in Deuteronomy 6. No flickering video monitors. No distracted staring out the window during church or class. No lazy assumptions that they could access knowledge online any time that they may want to, so they didn't have to look it up now. Just listening. The words and deeds of the Messiah heard in the scriptures, the words and deeds of David's descendant, Jesus of Nazareth, reported and recounted by their excited neighbors, and voila! As another apostle would explain later, faith comes by hearing. Because he'd had an earful, Bartimaeus, from two other gospels, we know his name, yelled for the two of these blind people, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. It's the fullness of time. It's Messiah time. He's here to heal and to bring sight to the blind as promised. The blind beggars may have had Psalm 146 in mind. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. What we are witnessing in this gospel lesson is the living out of the Psalms of Lament. The Psalms, such as Psalm 6, How long, O Lord? How long? And especially Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms that begin in anguish, cry to God, and through which he personally cruciforms 
our thoughts and feelings and ambitions so that they line up with his will for us. It's been a long blindness for these men. But as Matthew says, behold, it's Jesus, son of David, and the Lord God himself here in the flesh. We know historically what these men knew prophetically in just a few days. Jesus is going to live out Psalm 22 for all of us sufferers and mourners so that we can now pray his words in our prayers and be yelling back to God his own unalterable commitment to rescue us and to save us from the mouth of the lion, to feed us afflicted people, to proclaim his righteousness credited to our account to us here on this day in 2014 and to our children's children. These psalms are a sort of baptism, don't you see? Day by day, just as we drowned the old Adam in baptism, so too through these psalms, which are also a means of grace, they're God's word, day by day, we have to acknowledge our recurring blindness to God. So the question is this, are you and I praying? Are we praying the psalms? and the Psalms of Lament? Or are we now and then sort of giving voice to our own own homespun little wish lists? Think of these two blind beggars. Do we hear what they hear? Do we have ears to hear? Or are we perhaps despising the word in favor of our own homemade ways of dealing with blindness, affliction, and abandonment? Take to heart who is still coming down the road today, much as he came down the road at Jericho, and see to it, or put your ear to it, that you make these words your words and impress them on your children. Here's the conclusion of our text. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, Let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. The takeaway here is not simply that Jesus can give sight to the blind, a physical change and a miracle, to be sure. It's his person. What eye has seen, what ear has heard this? God has incarnated himself and can experience, did you hear it in the text? Visceral pity. Plato had maintained in Book Two of his Republic that God should never, ever be portrayed as being affected by anything. Sometimes in the 21st century, I think our theology is still infected with this notion that God doesn't care and isn't affected or moved by real mercy and compassion and pity. Perhaps you assumed that God's mercy and love is mere metaphor, but you were wrong. The true God, Jesus of Nazareth, is moved. He is moved by our plight. He is moved by our beggarliness. He is moved by his genuine love for each and every one of us. So, let us call out in our grief, in our suffering, in our recurring blindness, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. As he stopped at Jericho for these two blind beggars, he has stopped where we sit this morning. And he invites and authorizes us to address him as dear children ask their dear father, what do you want me to do for you? Amen.